welcome Anais. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Muriel. Um, which support for which project? Very uh, interesting question that is posed by the uh, Artec Foundation and Artec Forum. We could ask ourselves why did they gather such a, an international uh, panel to answer such a simple questions? The, the answer is it is absolutely not a simple question. Uh, digital creation is uh, very difficult to define for several reasons. Um, it is very fluid in terms of format. It includes uh, immersive creation, video game or not, following uh, some religions. Uh, and uh, it is also not internationally structured. The situation of this creation following different countries is very different. In terms of the creative scene, but also in terms of support. So uh, it makes it quite uh, difficult to, to grow internationally, to network internationally, despite the fact that it's also a big and growing business. Uh, and then um, the digital creation is also uh, obviously linked to innovation. And this is never stopping. Innovation, creative innovation, but also technological innovation never stops. So it's very difficult to imagine um, very strict and very defined structure for such a creative, um, a creative scene. So to discuss those topics, I have the chance uh, to welcome today Olivier Fontenay. He's the head of digital creation Depart department at uh, CNC, a Centre de la Cinématographie et de l'Image Imagée. And uh, Olivier is, uh, has this position since uh, 2020. Uh, as such, you, you tell me if I'm wrong, but as such is responsible for the immersive creation, video game, but also uh, storytelling innovation in, with ICREAM. So you have the three, the three. In fact, we, we used to say that we have three main areas at the CNC, cinema, audiovisual, and everything else. Okay, so I'm everything in charge else. of everything else. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But also before that, um, you used to be developer, producer, and editor uh, for different projects in uh, digital projects. So you have a long experience in terms of... I'm afraid I have yes. a long experience. So we're looking forward to hear you. And then we also have Corinne Zoland. Corinne, she's an actor, but not only, she's been really a preeminent uh, researcher, conceptor uh, for the Swiss digital scene. She's been active in the Digital Bühne in Zurich, but she's also a researcher in the University of Zurich in the immersive art space. And she is um, a very well-known specialist for motion capture, and she's also a performer in motion capture. So some fans, and if you follow the activities of series, she is also performing in our national uh, pride NOMAD. And um, we also welcome Toby Coffey. Toby is head of digital development at National Theatre of London in UK, and uh, as such, is responsible for the overall creative digital strategy of um, the National Theatre. But uh, since 2016. I uh, developed a studio, the immersive, story, immersive storytelling studio, and they, uh, they, are, they, are, they are making a very interesting uh, uh, productions that are um, traveling internationally. The latest is Museum of Austerity that is starting in November, right, in Manchester. And um, so it's very interesting to have your point of view then on this question. And last but not least, thank you uh, for Toby. And the last but not least, uh, Paola, Paola Gazzani Marinelli. Paola was responsible for the digital uh, programs and professional programs at the Geneva International Film Festival and Geneva Digital Market. Uh, she really developed uh, the immersive programs and she also coached a lot of studios that uh, were uh, Swiss studios that were starting in the realm of, the, of these uh, programs. And she switched early this year to the Fondation pour la Création Numérique, Le Pôle Numérique, the Digital Hub, uh, which uh, just um, organized in ECAL a summit 
les assises de la création numérique, oui. Summit for Numerical Creation, where they gather artists, studios, but also institutions to answer this precise question. Uh, what uh, kind of support to which project? And uh, that was interesting for them to have uh, in Switzerland an answer directly from the scene. So can you maybe, as a start, tell us a bit more about what happened there? Yes, of course. Um, first of all, um, hello everyone and thank you for inviting me. Um, so the Digital Creation Hub is an emerging structure, is an emerging entity. We are active only since November last year. And um, our, our main goal is to stimulate, foster digital creation uh, in Switzerland and uh, through different uh, and various initiatives such as call for projects and professional submits, professional meetings uh, like we are uh, on, on discussing on uh, financial digital creation like we are doing today. So um, the starting point of the Assise de la Création Numérique, the submit we organized in June, 22nd and 23rd uh, uh, June, was that uh, in Switzerland there is no incentive uh, program, incentive um, uh, project uh, compared for digital creation compared to other disciplines like theater, um, uh, dance and music, but the awareness that resources are needed for this uh, field are, um, it, it is growing, whether at the federal, uh, cantonal, and communal level. So we decided to uh, to put this uh, topic at the center of uh, uh, this Assise de la Création Numérique, and we brought together 40 participants for the plenary session and 15 participants for the working groups and it was two days professional event and it was divided in um, a part was a presentation of the best practice uh, um, in other countries <laughs> and another another part was a more um, practical moment um, uh, with three different gr um, working groups and we propose um, three possible models um, one was uh, a standard model, one was the, a dynamic model, uh, and the, the last one was an e excellence model. So the first one is uh, based on the usual, um, um, the usual funding of, uh, sorry, of cultural projects uh, uh, in, uh, in Switzerland and the audiovisual fields as well but um, taking into account uh, all the specificity of digital creation. The second one, the dynamic model, uh, was based uh, in, on a very innovative approach about the, um, the notion of support, what we support. So we support a project or we support maybe a request uh, from, from creators. And the last one was the excellent, uh, excellent uh, models, which was more based on um, the, um, the Swiss National Fund, so the, 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 the National Fund for Research. So to find um, less, uh, a less amount of projects, but with significant uh, resource and uh, monitoring results. So after two days, <laughs> sorry, I need to summarize because at, um, in any case, in, in our website, uh, polnum.ch, uh, 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 there is uh, 52 pages uh, reports on, on, on these <laughs> two days of uh, working groups. So do not hesitate to check it out. It's in French, I'm sorry. But at, um, <laughs> um, at the end, um, yeah, we, we, we provide uh, participants with a series of questions and an evaluation, an evaluation uh, grid. Uh, so that they can rate uh, in a scale of 1 to 10 um, if uh, that model is um, uh, fostering the emergency of uh, talent, if uh, this model is uh, very um, fit with uh, the specificity of digital creation, etc., etc. And so the first model was considered not, uh, not satisfactory. The second, the dynamic, uh, really satisfactory, and the, and the third model, excellent model, was really was considered satisfactory, but with some improvements. So, some 
and not only um, uh, not only this one this 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 this, this model with other models in in, in the same uh, in this I'm just asking you yes. a short question when you you gathered that was people in involved because there is always it's a bit problematic to have big discussion about digital creation because we never know which kind of art goes into. So when you discussed that, you were englobing like from video games to immersive the theater included all the realities? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And uh, yes, it was um, digital creation at large. So XR, of course, but also digital arts, uh, interactive media, um, uh, artistic parts is linked to AI. Uh, we, 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 we hosted also an, an artistic uh, um, that did AI uh, art. So it was um, digital, digital creation, video games, digital creation at, at large, yes. And so it was also an occasion, an opportunity for people that comp don't, don't know each other uh, to, to, to have this kind of event that can structure the, the field, you know? And the dynamic model in two words, before I, I switch maybe to... So the dynamic model in two words is, uh, is uh, so it's this uh, paradigm shift from to support a project or to support a request. So we... We, we propose to, um, to have this kind of mechanism uh, so the, the request could be not only a financial contribution but could be um, a technical um, expertise from, uh, from a partner that you, you, you cannot reach in, this, in the, the moment you are creating a, a, a piece or it could be a residency or it could be a research in specific uh, elements of your project. Uh, so the idea is to put more attention in what are um, really the needs of creators and to have something that really evolves so, because digital creation is the field where technology rapidly evolves. So, so in six months, every six months, you in the digital technological innovation change your practice. So, so the idea is to also have something very evol evol iterative also. And, um, and yes, in, in, in two words, it, it's, uh, it's, it is. <laughs> Thank you. And Olivier, you mentioned you don't want to be put in the position, someone that gives lessons, but for us in Switzerland, we always look at France like a, a, pay, a country more in advance than we are, because we are in the moment, in a momentum in which we are trying, we are starting to imagine what kind of support we will put in place in the future. Uh, what is your reaction to what uh, Paola just described, like dynamic models that could really be more adapted to this kind of creation, offering different kind of supports? I do share a lot of things of what was just said, because I do think funding is something really important, but it's not always the only thing that is important, especially for artists and creators. Uh, and as I said to you earlier, I think something really important that maybe is not enough discussed here is that artists and creators are really the basis of everything that is done. This is the Art Tech Forum, we are talking a lot about tech and business, and it's really important. I do think we should talk a little bit more about artists and creation and what are their, their needs. I, I said I do not want to be in position to give any lessons because mostly I think uh, we've, in France we have the chance to be a bit ahead and in advance. In fact, CNC was created almost 80 years ago to help, after World War II, the cinema to be recreated and to have the opportunity to, to get access to the culture again. We are helping digital creation for 25 years. I don't know if some of you remember CD-ROM and cultural CD-ROM about museum, about artists and everything. We were there already. Uh, for 20 years, we were helping video games and then it went to web series. And then we helped the first VR experience probably 10 years ago. It was something quite simple. It was only 360 video. Step by step, we have tried to understand what kind of support artists and companies need. And of course, I know the first answer is money. We all know that, but it's not always so easy. As you said, the question is simple. The, the answer is that it's not. You need to know what you want to help, in which way, and at which stage. We try to focus a lot for a couple of years into the early stage of the creation. 
we try to give as much possibilities as possible to the artist and then to the emerging company. Most of the company in the digital area are very fragile. You do not meet very big company apart from the video game industry, which is something quite different. So we do feel we need to support artists, we need to support innovation, but we need to remember that the goal is to set up an industry. This is really, really something important. It's not something that is vulgar or something like that to talk about industries, company, and the fact that company needs to make some money to be able to produce interesting artists and interesting art. So we always think in the way that we are a public service. We do not care ourselves about the, the economic results of a product on a short-term point of view. But in a long-term view, you need to focus on people that are able to provide you with art that customer audience are going to see or to buy. This is really something important if you want to create something in the long term. Thank you. The two other panelists are more on the creative produ production side. What do you think of this? Uh, what do, would you need or what was the, the most help, helpful uh, incentive to have a sustainable uh, creative system? Uh, maybe let's start with you, uh, Corinne. Uh, yes, so I really like this um, aspect that you just mentioned um, from maybe a perspective of the actor in a, in a production pipeline, um, I realize sometimes that we don't talk enough um, because the project phases don't involve, of course, the whole team because that would be way too expensive. Um, but for example, if I can come in as an actor at a, an earlier stage, as a motion capture performer, and can already um, have like a development phase with the animator, who is then in the end developing the character, um, we, can, we have different perspectives on that character and that character can um, become something or someone completely different than um, if these processes would happen um, in individual rooms and not connected to each other. So um, I really think the one way of looking at sustainability is to really get the, the people involved in projects maybe sooner together um, in a room, <laughs> but also virtual um, and to to yeah, to involve, um, to respect artists in, in all the different positions um, to bring something um, creative to the, to the process and to connect them. And that's what I really liked um, about what you just, just said. And also the, um, I, I take notes, <laughs> um, with the, the dynamic support. Um, I really liked the, the idea of residencies um, because it just allows for for people to create an environment that doesn't isn't necessarily product um, oriented, but it can be. So whatever comes out um, can be shared. And um, I also think that product oriented processes have a, a nice dynamic because um, things come out, um, people maybe push themselves more to create something um, together. And um, that's how kind of the, this community can, can become bigger and become closer together. Because we were talking before that we're really isolated most of the time. Um, and festivals and conferences like this are a way of bringing us closer, but I think it it needs more work and this kind of structural um, support is something that, that, that is lacking um, in my point of view. Toby, uh, with your studio, you produced uh, pieces that are internationally acclaimed, like all kinds of limbo and um, drawn me close. Do you feel sustainable? Uh, I mean, can you see, like, in five, ten years, the development of your studio? And if so, uh, how did it happen? How do you do you manage to to get into this uh, sustainability? I mean, I think that is the fact that you said five to ten years is a good um, amount of time to talk about. Um, I think very often people who are new to the uh, kind of emerging tech or emerging technology industries 
and how it relates to XR are looking for one to two to three year turnarounds. And actually this is, for me, uh, XR and emerging technologies is like a whole new genre coming into land, like the gaming industry or uh, you know, even like film and TV, they took time to establish themselves uh, with audiences uh, into how we understand them to be today. Um, so I'm very lucky to work uh, for an organization which is artist-led, which is very, very important, um, and one that has a real strong sense of innovation at its core, uh, but also uh, has uh, the intelligence of leadership that recognizes the work that we're doing now is more for longer term uh, than it is for the short term. And actually when I showed um, a first piece of VR to Rufus Norris, who's our artistic director, he said, um, we've got to do something with this now. He said, you don't know where this is going, I don't know where it's going, but as a national storytelling organization, it's really important to find out what it means for us and what theater means for it. Um, and I think the thing that was really interesting at that point is he abstracted out what we do as an organization to call ourselves a storytelling organization. Uh, and with that, you know, a, a story doesn't need to be a full script. There's many ways that a story can present itself. Um, so in 2016, we set up the studio, which is essentially a space where we bring storytellers together with creative technologists to create new forms of performance, audience experience and storytelling. A storyteller can be a writer, director, designer, choreographer. Uh, creative technologist is somebody who understands the tech as much as, sorry, someone who understands the art as much as they understand the tech. And then in terms of coming back to your question about sustainability, uh, to get to this point, we've been sustainable through collaboration and support. It's really, really important. Um, and we work with other arts organizations, we work with big tech companies, um, and uh, at the moment, I would say the immersive space is very collaborative. I think once we get to the point where proper commercialization comes in, that might change a little bit, um, but it, now is the time for us all to be uh, collaborating, and we are kind of, reaching a second phase of the studio, whereas we, whereas we will still continue uh, pure artistic development, we are going to start matching, uh, we're going to start putting down some parameters uh, uh, to say, okay, what might a performance look like if that, perform, if that show itself, rather than the whole portfolio, if that show needs to be commercially sustainable, not profit generating, but sustainable. Um, what does that look like? And start having artistic intent towards those kind of targets. That's how I think we will be uh, in five to 10 years sustainable. Thank you, that's really interesting model. I just wanted to ask you because you mentioned tech companies and this art tech uh, forum is also bringing together people from the tech and private sector. Um, how is the, the collaboration with also, Corinne, maybe you can then tell something about collaboration with, with the private sector in the immersive uh, creation. Uh, do yeah, I mean, we've, um, I mean, I guess the, the short answer would be what we found is we work with a number of partners, um, smaller companies, we get to work with a lot quicker. Um, bigger companies can take years um, to get to that uh, point of, of uh, collaboration or support. I think a big part of that is that nobody these days likes to just give a check and the, lo the brand guidelines of how you should credit them. Everybody wants this kind of symbiotic relationship. They want a technical truth that they can say, yes, we have provided support above and beyond um, finance. And when you get that, it really, really works, but it's, um, yeah, that, that, that kind of relationship i found takes more time. Um, and each organization is, is, is um, different in its own culture. But again, I think 
as for an artist, for example, as or somebody who runs a studio, come into events like this or go into film festivals, um, that is the kind of breeding ground for relationships and ideas and contacts and you don't know who you're going to meet that's going to be important further down the line. So I think there is that whole... Net, it's, it's important to network and to, to find out what other people might be able to do for you and also what you can do for them. Um, um, personally, I find it a bit um, challenging <laughs> to navigate um, between positions of um, uh, critical research um, of technology and um, being an artist and wanting to live of it. Um, <laughs> um, and um, what I've discovered for myself is that when you put in, into perspective how Switzerland, like how tiny it is, and that there is really not so much of an industry that me pers personally, as an actor, um, can work in just one single medium. It's just, if, if I had a fixed position at a theater, maybe then, so. But um, if I navigate through these different media and in these different art forms, um, I will eventually take, I just did a, a job for um, FIFA um, for their new VR experiences. Um, and um, then I will take on other artistic projects and to navigate between these um, projects is, is actually thrilling um, and also challenging um, as a, a person but also as an artist. Um, and it's, it, for me, um, I find it very interesting because it leads to the really, really interesting conversations with other artists and with founders um, and with um, people who invest. Um, because these are the conversations that are of interest to me, like the intersectional conversations and not this uh, poll or this poll, I don't know how you say it, um, but extreme. Um, yeah, so it's a challenging question for me, but uh, certainly an interesting one. If I can maybe add something, I had the opportunity yesterday to go and visit Gilles Jobin's studio. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, he deserves that. Uh, Gilles, as you all know, is a choreographer, but he's also at a very high level technical. You're is here, it? Gilles? Yeah. Is uh, uh, he's at a very high level in motion capture. I was really surprised to have someone working on Unity. You may know Unity, which is a tool and a game engine. And she was a dancer. And in fact, a dancer working with Gilles is now working also on the technical point of view. And I find that really interesting. I say the artist has the key, but you cannot be the key on, on an art that you do not master. You need to understand fully the technology because technology leads your art in a certain way. It's really complicated, but it's really, really important to keep that in mind. That's also why um, I'm kind of trying to push the agenda of putting motion capture into resumes of art schools, like who teach actors, because I really, I really, I know, I believe, um, I experienced it, that um, your craft changes um, when you have to adapt to this technology. And we've heard this before on the, on the panels. Um, and it's super interesting to combine these classical theories, you might not have heard of it, but like the psychological gesture, um, which is a very traditional um, acting theory um, to then put it into emotes, which is um, a very specific thing for games, uh, and to kind of do put these concepts together. Um, uh, yeah, I agree. Well, it would be impossible to make a resume of what was what has been said because it was really interesting and, and intense. But let's say, maybe to discuss a bit more, the bright side of the digital creation, it, it puts down some barriers between the arts there's new ways of storytelling that are really fascinating and that can really also change our relationship to stories. And um, it's also involved technical innovation and then also give new competence uh, uh, for artists and storytellers. On the other side, I hear there is a lot of pressure. Uh, the pressure to get the money, to understand how to get the money, but also the pressure to collaborate with the public sector. So uh, maybe to come back to you, Paola, when you had those discussions with the, the Swiss scene, that was expressed 
Do, could you feel that those were some, you know, maybe answers uh, that were foreseen? And maybe then also, uh, Olivier, you can tell us about the situation in France, about that, if... Um, so, I, I don't know if I really get the question, but... Uh, How to put a system that allows this creation to develop itself with, a, with less pressure than actually the pressure between the institutions that maybe uh, have some incentive but are not really up to date yeah. compared to, the, to what are the needs and the public sector, which is a big international business and is not always uh, very responsive to small artistical projects. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The balance, yes. Um, so something that really pointed out um, after the summit Les Assises de la Création Numérique was that um, the technical support, the technical device, the technical medium, it's, we, we, we should not focus uh, all this attention on, on it because um, uh, it's, um, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's the technical device, the technical support uh, that depends on artistic creation and not the other way around. Um, also, it was really important um, as well to, to point that uh, digital, it's, um, it's a, it, it can be, it, it's a discipline and not only a technique that it's uh, used to, to serve a pre-existing uh, discipline like, uh, I said, the dance, the theater and, and music. So, um, uh, the idea is, was really, um, also this distinction that it, it's really uh, common in uh, incentive program like uh, um, in interactive and narrative works. This differentiation is not really in line with the, um, with the creator's uh, practice. Uh, um, so all these things are, were really important at the end of the two days uh, working. And, um, and also we really uh, focus on the um, the public fundings during these two days. So we don't we, and and we don't really we don't really um, talk about the financial dimension. But we we was we were we were supposed to um, brainstorm about what could be digital creation, what could be a public funding, uh, cultural public funding for digital creation, and. Yeah, at, at the end, I think also that a balance between between the public funding and private funding could could be a very good solution also for an incentive uh, program like like Canada, for example, with the uh, Canada Film Fund. Yeah. Well, this is not my favorite topic, but I have to say a few words about money. Uh, the overall budget of the CNC is 700 million euros. The budget of my, my yearly budget of my department is 100 million euros, um, which seems to be a very important number. Most of this money, probably 80%, is going to the video game industry because this is an industry and the number are, are huge. And to produce a video game, even an independent video game, you need to have at least one or two million euros, if not 30 million euros. Roughly 10 million are going to, to the immersive creation and 10 million are going to specific innovation fund and technology and everything. Uh, this is what we feel is needed, and of course it may seem, again, very important, but mostly for the French company in the immersive area, it's still difficult for them, because we cannot fund more than 50% of an overall budget, and so far there are not really private funding on this kind of project, mainly because there are not really audience and everything, but this is a very, it would be a one hour long to discuss this point. This said, we want to make an acceleration specifically on the creative and immersive project, and we have just announced a couple of days ago uh, a new fund, which is going to be 150 million euros only for creative immersive project and metaverse project. This is going to be during three years a 15 million euros funding that is going to be provided to specially technological project in the immersive area, but also distribution and diffusion project. 
it's only for French company, I'm afraid, <laughs> or European company. But one of the other things that I wanted to say is that it's really important for us at the CNC on every domain, but especially in this area, to work on co-production. And I do welcome company from Swiss, artists from Swiss, from, <laughs> well, it's going to be tough <laughs> with the England, thanks to the Brexit, but anyway, we do like to have international co-production, not only from the, from the financial thing, but we do feel that artists from different countries working together can create something interesting. It's also a way for countries where the funding is not that big to have access to bigger budgets. So this is really something that we do a lot and we see a lot of this project. So this is maybe a way for, for companies from Switzerland to start step by step to increase their possibilities. Um, there was two points I just wanted to pick up on. Um, I think there's the need for funding for digital creation, most definitely, but also a need for digital literacy. Like we have to give artists time to get used to the medium and to uh, make work that isn't necessarily made to be seen. I think what we, you know, definitely 2016, 17, we were at a point in time where people would publish whatever they made. Um, and that wasn't necessarily the best indication of what the potential of the industry was, because there was a lot, I would say, of substandard work that was out there. So we practice, 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 and then put your best foot forward. We need to give space for that. And then I think so interesting about uh, the proportion of your money which goes to game developers, because um, we talk about this quite a lot, and I obviously recognise the, the value of the gaming industry, but it's like, for me, uh, from a performing arts organisation, I think what is going to happen is the gaming platforms will become more ubiquitous, and we won't necessarily refer to them as gaming platforms anymore. You may go to that platform to play a game, you may go to see a piece of performance. I mean, there was quite a lot. I think the music and the fashion industry made quite significant jumps in lockdown uh, than some of the other industries have. And I, that, that, that's a real big thing for me. And I know big broadcasters are looking at this as well. They believe their audiences are gonna be on the, these platforms that we currently call gaming platforms in five to 10 years time in volumes uh, that nobody is kind of predicting at the moment. You know, one of the questions that we have very frequently is why do we continue to help video game? Because they are selling so many video games. Uh, and that's true, they are selling so many video games right now. Uh, but in fact, it's really important, even when an industry is there, to keep the opportunity for the creators in one country to work. It's really important. We have something like 20,000 people working in the video game area right now in France. And so this is something that we are going to continue. One of the biggest chance of the immersive and video game market is the globalization. I mean, you are a creator in Switzerland, you push one button and your immersive experience, video game, whatever, can be accessible in any country in the world. This is an opportunity that never exists in the previous art area. But the dark side of that is that anybody can do that anywhere in the world. You have so many opportunities, so many competition, so we still need to help everybody in all this area to have simply the possibility for the creator of a country to express themselves. It is, we are sadly coming to the last minutes of this panel. The last word to the artist, Corinne. Uh, do you have any like reflection or Commenter to, to share with us uh, <laughs> about what was um, being said and maybe about this tension between the fact that in this realm of, of creation we want to keep the innovative character of the, the, the digital creation, but also, yes, there is an international business going on and those two spheres are coexisting. Um. Maybe just that this exchange keeps happening, um, which it hopefully will um, anyways, but um, um, to have this exchange of the examples and also learn from best practices um, that we, as Switzerland, um, are open um, and to collaborate, to co-produce, 
Um, I've just worked in two projects that, um, a Swiss, that were Swiss studios co-produced actually with French studios and um, they were great teams and it was so much fun and uh, I don't know how it was for the producers um, <laughs> but um, we would have to ask them um, but yeah to, to just keep an open mind um, and uh, go like watch watch the artworks and kind of that's also something that's for me in the circles that I um, work in um, we sometimes don't have the necessary means to travel to all the festivals and to see all the fancy um, projects and products <laughs> um, everywhere um, so accessibility is still a topic um, yeah I think um, maybe also funding there would help um, for artists to be able to travel um, and to see projects and experience them in real life and then with a the headset, um, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Toby uh, and Olivier for coming from afar to discuss it with us. Uh, thank you, uh, Corinne and Paola collaboration, co-production, and later on, the opportunity also to see Cosmogony by Gilles Jobin to see an actual uh, digital uh, art. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Merci. Thank you very much. And I guess uh, tonight we will see, I think, a spectacular performance that will make us better understand what we've just heard during this panel discussion. Our next speaker is the current head of Accelerator at Cult Tech Accelerator, a platform whose objective is to bring the full power of technology to culture for the benefit of society. The idea is to make culture more financially independent and accessible to all. Please welcome Samantha Pena. Welcome, everyone. I'm just going to... Great. So, hello. I just wanted to say a quick thank you to everyone for having me here. It's been so interesting so far, and it's great to have these forums to be able to talk about all of the great topics that have been discussed. Um, as it was mentioned, I'm Samantha. I'm leading the Caltech Accelerator, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in a second. Before we start, I wanted to explain what is Caltech. So Caltech comes from culture and technology. It is not tech for cults, which is, you know, very misleading. But um, as Miros mentioned, we're here to really empower the culture and creative industries by having the power of technology behind it. It's not necessarily about the technology, but, but about the people that we're empowering with it, whether it's the creatives, the creative industries, or the audience to have more access to everything. Again, before I get into the Caltech Accelerator, I wanted to mention that we're part of a bigger ecosystem. It actually starts with the Caltech Association, which is a nonprofit which works to create, enhance, oh, sorry, to create, educate, empower, and connect. We've been part of different um, collaborations like Vienna Contemporary, Arts Electronica, Vienna Up, and they continue to do amazing work to get the movement out there. And talking about the wider ecosystem. We can't obviously do it alone. We have several initiatives that come with us. So when it comes to building a unified space, we have um, one of the initiatives is to create, to accelerate, and to fund. These initiatives are the Legendary Inventory Builder, the Caltech Accelerator, and the New Renaissance Funds that we just announced in June. So in terms of the Venture Builder, we are currently looking always for entrepreneurs who want to join us in Entrepreneur in Residence to create new Caltech startups. Um, it's an intensive program, but you look at different ideas and create startups within your team, and later you're spun out. So if you're interested, or if you know any entrepreneurs that might be interested in creating Caltech startups, feel free to let them know. Before I get into the accelerator, I'm going to touch on the Venture Fund. It is a $20 million fund that has been recently launched to create, um, to focus on the cultural and tech industries. So make sure you get in touch with them. All right, now for the fun part of the accelerator. We have a three-month program basically focused on tech, sorry. We have a three-month program basically focused on tech entrepreneurs, focused on the cultural industries that runs twice a year. And why do we exist? Basically because it's an incredibly fragmented space, as you all know. It is very hard to really understand who the references are, who to talk to, who cares about this. 
Um, it is sometimes by investors not seen as profitable. We're trying to change that narrative by investors, by inviting investors to all of our events as well. And of course, sometimes when you talk about the startup world and the tech world, it's not a trend. Not like fintech or health tech or climate tech. A lot of times, entrepreneurs in the cultural space find themselves having to explain the value of culture and art. So this is why the Cultic Accelerator exists. And we started only two years ago, but we are a growing community where we welcome you all to come. So in terms of the accelerator, we already have an MPS of 90, which is a pretty good indicator that they're having fun at least um, with us. We have a growing community of 34 startups and over 400 applications in our program. We are strongly supported by a number of organizations as well that partner with us for mentorships, expertise, um, perks. However you want to come um, and collaborate with the community, you're always welcome to come talk to us. We have three main pillars at the Accelerator. We have the knowledge sessions, we have the mentoring, and the network. So in terms of the mentoring, I actually want to mention it because it's a little different than all the other ones. Since culture is a big space, we don't necessarily have a set roster of mentors that come every year and we try to match. We actually do a personal scouting for each one of the startups. They're all very different and diverse, so we try to make sure that it's a personalized program from the beginning. We only accept eight to 10 startups per batch. When it comes to the knowledge sessions, there's three main buckets that we lead. So in terms of the business, starting and leading a business basically and how to get investor ready is one of the main buckets. Um, another big bucket is personal growth as a leader and the mental health. As you know, this is one of the things that is a big um, problem for founders where they get burned out. We love to include this and we find it's a basic information for founders to have on how to take care of themselves. And of course, how to succeed in arts and culture, which is a big part of why this program is so special. We have a three-month program, but it takes a lot longer than that. We're obviously always scouting for new startups. We do a thorough onboarding process, including the mentor scouting. We recently had kickoff last week in Vienna during Arts Electronica Festival, and we do an online program with another in-person demo day in Vienna. This time, it will be on the 20. 9th and 30th of November, so if anybody wants to join, please let me know. Our deal flow is highly international. We get applications from all over the world, mainly Europe, because we are based here, but we are open to everywhere. A lot of, uh, a lot of our applications come from Western Europe and the Dach region, and we have a high level of diversity and female founders. We're always looking for more, more diversity in all areas, um, but we're happy to report that it is a pretty high number, although it could always be better. In terms of verticals, we also have quite a diverse set of verticals that are represented, but obviously the strongest verticals from our applications are music, cultural heritage, and digital, digital art. So what kind of innovations are we talking about? When we talk about culture, we have a number of verticals as we've seen as well with the other talks. And when it comes to technology, we also have a number of things. So you start mixing and matching all of these <laughs> different things and you get an infinite amount of possibilities when it comes to the cult tech world or the art tech world. We really have the same mission. So one of my favorite things to do is to brag about the startup. So here goes a few examples. Um, we have Eno, which was one of our participants from batch number one. They are a profusion, basically the music sheet of the 21st century. A lot of the times this is still a very paper-based process, and they just recently closed a seed round of 10 million, I think. Yes, pre-seed, no, pre-series A of 10 million. We have Artcentrica, which is an ed tech platform. They're a part of Batch 2, an Italian-based startup. They do, uh, basically for educational purposes, they help teach the younger generation and not-so-younger generation about art in many different ways from it from a digital perspective where you can zoom into the artworks, get a different examples, even to search for similar examples of where this has been seen before of different influences. We have My Culture, which is an Austrian-based startup, which basically helps you navigate all of the arts and culture events around you. A lot of the times we want to see an exhibit, we think we have time, then the deadline passes, we haven't actually gone. So this helps you keep track of that, of everything that's going on to make sure you don't miss a beat. Maya, another Italian, also German-based, are actually in Berlin, but Italian founders. Uh, Maya Centrica is a social network that are just launched their beta, and it's an incredibly fascinating social platform because it, they try to redefine human connection, not just mindlessly scrolling through Instagram, but really connecting with our human beings 
by the contemplation of contemporary art. MetaWalls is another Berlin-based um, startup, and what they do is fascinating with NFTs. They actually give the power back to the artists. So they recently had one with a Berlin wall where they were able to raise 11 Ether, uh, where this is a, an artist, which right now I'm forgetting, sorry, <laughs> but I will find it out for you, um, where he was able to finally collect some revenue from his art. So they work on preservation, um, of getting the historicals of street art and street artists, so empowering the street artists with a way of having some ownership over their work and also to preserve it. As we know, street art is quite temporary. Perform Vu, they just recently joined our batch four. They're a New York-based company, and they're basically launching the Netflix of experimental, experimental art. Uh, they have a number of videos with a, a ton of performances that are beautiful, so if you like to see it as a way of just relaxing at home and seeing some beautiful performances. We have ScanArt, which is an inventory system which has an image recognition software that allows you to scan art. So if you go to a gallery, for example, and you don't wanna, like if you wanna know more information about it, for example, the price, um, Godfrey, the, the founder, always explains how one of the times he went to a gallery and he was interested in purchasing a painting, he went to the gallery manager and was like, hey, how much does this uh, painting costs, and the manager was like, looked him up and down, and said, like, oh, you can't afford it, and just walked away, and this is how Scanner was born, actually, to make sure that people don't have that experience. So on one side, for the audience, you have all of the information you need about the piece, and also for the galleries, you're able to manage your inventory. Papillon is another batch four participant that just recently joined. They're also Austrian-based, and they basically are able to take all the online and offline data that a museum gathers and be able to put it in an understandable and actionable uh, manner so that you can actually engage your audience in a whole new manner. And finally, Aerochainum. They are working towards the preservation and monitoring of art, of fine art. So they do, in less than a three minute scan, they're able to um, get these beautiful replicas, your digital twins, in an NFT format, but also in a way that you can actually monitor. So if, for example, you're transporting your art from A to B and it gets dented, you can actually prove it also for insurance claims. So it's actually quite easy um, to, to, to track and see how the pieces are evol evolving through time and if they need any restoration. As well, they do NFTs, so you can be a part owner and help the preservation of these pieces by the sales of the NFTs that they have. So these are just some examples of the many that we have. Feel free to scan the code or come to me later. We have a number of them also empowering artists um, and in different areas that I'm sure you'll love to see. And I'm just gonna see a couple of phones, so I'm just gonna leave it there for a second. We have in music, in art, we have, for example, lands for freelancers, freelancers that struggle so much sometimes to get their point across, um, you know, and get visibility. It's kind of the LinkedIn for freelancers. So if you want to join the community, feel free. I'm going to leave this up here. If you want to get involved as a mentor, expert, or if you're a startup, I will have the next QR code, and I think it's almost my time. If you've missed any of them, please come find me later. But thank you so much for your time, and I hope to talk to you soon. Thank you very much, Samantha. Um, so for our next round table, our panelists, we were, we're not going to take a break right now. We were supposed to take a break right now, but since we're running late, we're not going to. But there is coffee available for those who want to leave the room, but I think you should stay for our next round table. Um, our panelists will address the creative ecosystem in the Vaux Canton, a canton which we heard earlier today is at the forefront of innovation. This roundtable will be moderated by Emilien Schenker. He is the visual communications designer. He is a, pardon, pardon me, visual communications designer and a business administration graduate. And for the past seven years, he's gained extensive experience working for public administrations, which has given him a very comprehensive overview of Switzerland's political and economic landscape. So we look forward to hearing from him and from his panel members. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, we are going to take a little bit of your time to discuss about art and tech, obviously, but we will go down the road of, down the road of business. And I have the pleasure to be joined on stage by three brilliant minds. Uh, the first one is Pierre Couta, CEO 
and co-founder of Time Designers, which is an early stage spin-off from EPFL that is literally making waves in the field of watchmaking and creating ultra luxe, deluxe type of hand and timepieces. Join, thank you. The second is Sofiane Malouli, co-founder and CEO of Furin Kazan, a growth startup that has developed a free video game called Optical, and that is allowing, of, allowing any of us to access the astral world. The third one is Loïc Baboula, co-founder and CTO of Artmin, a later stage spin-off from EPFL as well, that has given a new, a new perspective, a new vision to imaging services for auction houses, private collectors, and also museum visitors. Thank you so much for joining us. Sorry. So obviously we were all gathered here today for art and tech. And I wanted to open up this discussion in asking all three of you, what was your personal connection to art and the creative world and how that eventually shaped your approach of creating and launching your own business? Maybe Pierre, if you want to start up. I know that you said you were inspired by Salvador Dali, so maybe that's a starting point. Definitely. Oh, it's not working. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes, in fact, uh, during my childhood, my mother is a pianist, so she was playing piano from 8 in the morning to 8 p.m. And my father is from computer science, so while I was listening to piano, I was doing math with my father, and this is basically a good resume of uh, my childhood. Uh, next, I went to EPFL, and I met my best friend there, who's uh, also my associate now, uh, Guillaume Bonneau. And uh, we had this idea of bringing the beautiful physical phenomena we discovered uh, studying microscale physics into watches. And as you said, uh, it's exactly uh, the vision we imagine that uh, Salvador Dali would have uh, implement inside watchmaking if he had uh, some knowledge in uh, microscale physics. Thank you. Sofiane? Well, our relationship to art and technology is that as a video game and interactive media studio, um, our goal is to create an, a whole narrative world and, and to, to bring it to fantasy and science fiction, science fiction fans uh, through multiple products and experiences. So our main objectives is the creativity, the narrative world, and art is the way to uh, give it to the consumers through video games, through animated series, comic books, uh, um, virtual experiences, etc., etc. So, uh, technology for us is a tool, and creativity is the objective. Thank you. Well, as for me, I was uh, always in, very interested in photography, and uh, when, during my studies at EPFL, so I'm not uh, as young as my colleagues here, uh, in the 90s, I remember having a digital course, a uh, digital photography course, and uh, the professor, uh, Professor Sabine Sustrang, said, one day, digital camera will overtake uh, analog camera. So I am that old, you, you, you imagine. But I was always uh, very interested in uh, digital imaging. And uh, I continued all my studies to do up to uh, uh, my, my, all my studies in uh, scientific imaging. And uh, somehow, I got into this project uh, at EPFL. That was uh, the goal was to improve the way art is displayed on digital screen. That was a project uh, in collaboration with Google. Uh, four years of research, uh, blue sky research, applied research. That was a fantastic uh, period. Uh, after which uh, Artmin uh, was created. So um, yeah, that's the beginning. Thank you. And, and I can definitely say that you, you definitely managed to incorporate that in, into the, the company because I don't know if you are willing to just give a little bit more about the, what makes Artmin so special in this, in this landscape. So Artmin is uh, specialized in uh, the building uh, digital twins of physical artworks, so bringing, bringing physical artworks in the digital world uh, with uh, a true uh, feeling of owning and 
and manipulating the artworks in the sense that we can capture information that are not only uh, traditional to imaging, but also material reflectance. So imagine if you have a watercolor or an oil painting, uh, you will have a very much different feeling when you are interacting with it on the, on the screen. And uh, this, coupled with a very high resolution uh, imaging, you get what you have a, a real replica of the artwork. It's a fingerprint. Uh, you can compare the physical artwork and the digital one. And this can be used uh, for all the art markets that are from commercial aspect, for promotion, pr promoting art for auction house and galleries to art experts who wants to do digital condition report or to do an assessment after uh, carrying an artwork from A to B. Uh, also to artists. So we have uh, young artists coming to us to have their digital twin and have uh, lots of uh, different medium to uh, communicate about their work. So, um, yeah. Thank you. So, Fanny, maybe if I can ask you as well, because we obviously talked a lot about like using technology to we, we, somebody also used the digital type of uh, element or notion to refer to coming into a digital space, a different world, having access to others' opportunities. And I think through optical, that's, that was also the main intent. So how can you maybe specify on that on what way, in what way the, the project that you started is different, is unique in itself? Well, in, in my mind, the... Um the goal is to, again, uh, create a coherent, deep, immersive universe. Um, to explain it quickly, some scientists have recently discovered that there's a parallel world to ours existing, and this world, through rare contacts between our two worlds, has inspired our tales, legends, and mythologies. And this is why you can find uh, traces of extraordinary creatures, but depicted in the same way through uh, time and space. For example, you can find uh, dragons in medieval Europe, in the Chinese dynasties, and in the Aztec civilization. Uh, Yeti in Nepal, Bigfoot Sasquatch in North America. And uh, so, so we explain that uh, these depictions are coming from this uh, parallel world to ours. And the scientists have found ways to cross the frontier between our two worlds and to synthesize it in, your, in, a, in a device that you can slip in your pocket, which is the optical. Uh, uh, this is the, the scenario, the, the basis of our uh, first uh, project, which is a um, uh, mobile exploration video game. But from there, the goal is to expand this narrative universe um, through different products answering one another. Uh, for example, you will find questions, mysteries, in uh, the video game that will find answers in the comic book or uh, in the Hollywood movie that will uh, be realized with Spielberg in a few years, hopefully. Um, and, and the main point of the experience is really to uh, make sure that the, the fan, the consumer, the, the spectator will follow us through the different releases of these experiences uh, to make sure that uh, they will get to know everything about the, the question that they can ask them th themselves about this universe. And it was really important for us to, uh, to present the astral world through a co coherent and realistic uh, way in order to, to take the uh, spectator, um, you know, to, to embark him or her uh, in an experience where you don't know which is the, the end of the reality and the narrative side of the experience. So again, uh, in, in this, uh, uh, with this objective in mind, the technologies are a very good way to try to find new ways to embark uh, people with us. Thank you. What about you, Pierre, and your associate? How did 
like using and channeling all of that creativity turned into or morphed into uh, coming up with this new time piece that you imagine and using a very set uh, of technology to to offer that product uh, and in fact to, to to bring the idea we had to life uh, first we had to select because we were um, thinking about a lot of physical phenomena and we discovered them mainly in physics classes uh, at a moment when you can ask yourself why am I standing for uh, eight hours in a math class and listening to the teacher at a moment where it begins to be unpleasant to make so much math. And the reason we found was that at the beginning of the class, the teacher was like, uh, for instance, creating a, a flash of storming on stage or taking a gun, going on a rotating uh, plane, and uh, the shift of the bullet uh, is explained by the Coriolis force. And all those physical phenomena, when you discover them for the first time, like, it's really impressive. And we were wondering why are, could they not share the stage with jewelry inside timepieces? And uh, so first we selected among the idea we had, and next uh, we tried to think how to implement it. And this is about like two years of uh, research and development and collaboration with laboratories. Uh, so now it begins to be clearer. We de-riskified the technology. We know that it's feasible and we're gonna have a first at scale prototype in two weeks, something like that. So it's exciting when you're waiting for so long. And uh, yes, I think those are the main ideas. But there, are, there were plenty of actors involved uh, who made that possible. Thank you. So that also can allow me to switch into the second part of that conversation, because obviously that creativity requires so much time and efforts and having the, the opportunities to meet the right people, navigating into those, those waters, those entrepreneurial waters. And I just wanted to ask you as well, because all three companies of yours are in different sectors of application, but they have one common element. They were founded in the same region, which is Canton of Vaux. And Rafael also mentioned and earlier today about how this region is known nationally and even internationally as being a great ecosystem to develop one ID and take it to the next level. How did that translate for you? Uh, if if we go back a little bit in time for, for maybe Loïc and, and Sufian, given the fact that your companies are at different stage of development? I'll let Loïc talk because he's the, he was the first one. Right, so I think, um, so if I remember at the, the very beginning of uh, the company, you are always um, wondering if your product is gonna be uh, um, well accepted and it's as a, as a young entrepreneur you always look for a small spotlight whether it is an article in the newspaper um, um, acceptance to a sponsorship program like we had uh, the the fit foundation who sponsored us we had also uh, the imd uh, business business school who we which pa we participated uh, all these were absolutely great in terms of uh, uh, networking of uh, advice and uh, of course we had the chance to come out of epfl so we had already some some kind of credential or at least some uh, some uh, a, a big um, big institution behind us, so that helps. Uh, but um, as soon as you are out of uh, the academia, you, 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 need, uh, you need that support that comes from the Canton, from uh, also uh, incubator or accelerator, accelerator program, like uh, Venture Leaders, uh, Mass Challenge, that are also helping to, 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 mo to, to stay motivated. Uh, you, you, or of course, you have to approach investors. Um, you usually often start with family, fools, and friends, but it doesn't last very long. You need to get out and find um, more um, business angels and then maybe a venture capital or other strategic partners. And um, every time you, you have to prove yourself. It's, it's, a, it's never, uh, uh, you can never sit back and say, okay, now I've done it. 
Uh, now my company has been acquired by this American company called Invaluable. Uh, they are based in Boston. Um, we may have now some more financial security, but it's a completely new chapter. Now it's uh, the, the, the American uh, chapter, so new, new pressure, new di different business uh, uh, goals, um, and that's exciting. Thank you. Sophia? Well, I completely agree with uh, Loic. Um, entrepreneurship is hard. Uh, you often feel alone uh, and like battling against everything around you. And uh, to have the support of Canton de Vaux was a really good way. Okay, there's like financial support, you know, invitations to panels like this. Thank you, by the way. You're welcome. Um, and all kind of different supports, but the fact that you feel uh, believed in, firstly, is, is very, very important, uh, at least for me. It was because it showed that um, you believe in something and other people that are not just your mom and your girlfriend is believing in, in you as well. So, it's a start, uh, it's a start. <laughs> and um, another really important point uh, related to the Content Vos support is something that we don't often think about. It's the due diligence that brings a selection from Content Vos to to talk about a concrete example, um, we a few years ago, a few years ago, we were selected for a, to to represent uh, Canton de Vaux Innovation in Mexico. We were only four startup to go there, and uh, there was a lot of of uh, events and things organized uh, there. And one of one of uh, them was to um, to meet some big investors in Mexico. And the simple fact that we were selected by the Canton de Vaux to represent Vaux Innovation was like the best way to cross all of the uh, doubt barrier frontier that you can, that you should normally uh, go across with a potential investor. Like for them, the fact that we were there and selected by Canton de Vaux was an instant validation and this kind of, and, and the same, like if you are uh, supported financially, it's a good way to, to show to potential investors that public helps and public uh, organize, 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 sorry, are believing in you. And uh, yeah, again, it's, it was a very, very important uh, and thing for us. Thank you. What about you, Pierre? Because like it's pretty recent in comparison to the other two. But as like Loic mentioned, your your project is a spin-off from EPFL, so there's a, an entire ecosystem as well and different opportunities that just mix with with uh, pre-existing condition provided by the states or other partners as well. But how did that turn out for you so far? Definitely, I agree with everything what was said, and even more, I'm quite impressed by uh, how. Uh, how strong is the economical tissue uh, in Canton de Vaux? We raised all the money we needed up to this point in non-dilutive, uh, participating to grants, uh, to, to competitions, uh, for instance, business competition at HEC Lausanne, uh, design competition at, um, at ECAL. Um, we were supported by uh, watchmaking foundations, and uh, yes, there is plenty of uh, actors that are like smart and kind who can uh, give you help uh, in our field uh, in manufacturing what you want and also giving you advice about how to make it and also uh, finding uh, financial support and even more having uh, all the, the institute uh, that were presented tonight uh, today on those, uh, for financial support, uh, there are plenty of them in the canton and uh, we receive already few support from them. It's uh, very valuable. I'm not sure it's feasible to find so much uh, anywhere else. Thank you. And if I can quickly add something, um, I think that the Artec community is very lucky here in Vaux because it's, um, you know my my experience with the uh, with uh, competition contests or investors like classical investors. 
um, were quite hard at first because we were doing uh, video games and interactive media because uh, that wasn't seen as serious. And uh, it's been a few years now that Canton de Vaux tried to dig in, in the potential of our tech. Um, thanks to Caroline Coquerel uh, as well, which was like a pivotal, of, of pivotal importance uh, to start uh, studies and, and, um, and yeah, to studies to see if it was potentially interesting uh, to help our tech, the art tech community. And it's resulted in, in a concrete help um, with the fact that uh, we will be heard more easily, like taken more seriously, and initiative like Quartz Challenge. I even I heard that uh, she was selected as uh, the president of the jury. I don't know if it's confidential, yes. but it's uh, something great that she's. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I think we are very lucky uh, to be in Canton de Vaux uh, regarding the industry we are uh, in. Thank you. And so definitely, definitely uh, a tough journey towards like success and, and promising ventures. Um, but thanks to different ecosystems, maybe you, are able, you were able to, to find different partners and organization to help you on that road. Um, we are running a bit late on time, but I'm just quickly wanted to ask you one last question because obviously the future is ahead and the, this forum is also set in regards with international expansion. What is your next, what is at stake for you? What is the next challenge that you, you're embarking yourself with your project on? And maybe who knows in, in this audience that can also foster some, some great conversation helping you all on towards the next steps. Thank you for this good question. Uh, I think uh, our next step are to present uh, the prototype of the technology we did riskified to some fashion brand and watchmaking brand. Uh, we already discussed with uh, two major actors of the watchmaking industries who are interested for a partnership on our first product. And we are still investigating uh, if there is other opportunities to find the best one uh, to develop our first collection. And uh, once it will be done, we plan to uh, make a fundraising uh, first stage and. Uh, and just scale by creating the other idea of watches we have in mind. So to be quick, um, we are starting our growth phase uh, with the help of uh, a fundraising round we finished a few months ago. Uh, thanks to marvelous investors. One of them is here uh, today, so thank, thanks to, to him. Uh, we have now two main objectives. The first one is to release the products we already released on the French picking market uh, on an international market. The goal with this is to, is to validate the hypothesis we found um, through the analysis of key, of key point indicators uh, on the French picking market. Those were great, but now we have to do it on, an, uh, on a much bigger scale. And the second objective is the, the expansion of the whole narrative universe through the creation of different kind of new products like comic books, animated series, um, merchandising um, events, uh, touristical events, um, cultural events, and, uh, and yeah, to, to, to be a, a great license, like Star Wars, Marvel, etc. As for us, we want uh, to continue to strengthen our position and uh, consolidate our product line, uh, notably with expanding it. We, we have machine learning uh, coming uh, so, so strong uh, these last years, so it, uh, it opens fantastic possibilities uh, to use, uh, uh, to, to take advantage of, uh, of this uh, algorithm. And also we want to be more present uh, on, in the USA, we, since um, now we are, we have a, some feet over there. 
Thank you so much. I wish you all three uh, great success towards the next steps. And I'd like to encourage if anybody in the room is like an, an entrepreneur or a partner, a potential partner to reach out. I also have two colleagues that are seated in the front, which, which are Josela and Arnaud Croisier, who can also help you navigate that ecosystem and providing maybe new, new incentives. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, and it's nice to hear these really wonderful success stories. Our next panelist will continue the discussion with a, a different point of view, talking more about investments in the creative industry. It will be moderated by Christoph Weckerli, director of the Zurich Center for Creative Economies at the Zurich University of the Arts. His cultural policy research focuses on the intersection of art Design and Economy, Policy and Society. He was awarded the Swiss Design Prize for his research on the creative economies. So Christoph, we look forward to hearing from you and from your panel members. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, I will start by introducing the um, panel members. And there I have to say that um, we have um, not Laurence um, uh, on the panel, but um, Dara. Uh, maybe you can. Pr it's very fresh. Everything. Uh, can you pronounce your, your name in a in a perfect way? Yeah, my name is Daria Rzavtsova. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, and uh, Daria is um, uh, head uh, of uh, business development and partnership at um, Fuel Arts. Uh, if you go to the website uh, of Fuel Arts, then you find acceleration, analytics, venture in Web3, art and tech. And um, your focus for many years is business administration, art market, NFT is what I can, uh, art and tech. And... Um, I have Thierry, he is um, on, the, on the slide. Uh, he is um, the founder of uh, a pan-European investment network called Media Deals, focusing on cross-border media tech investment. He is um, also working as business consultant, business developer, and an expert to the European Commission. And he is also an investor in the, in the field um, of the creative industries. Um, so we have quite an, an, um, an interesting range. It's also different generations, um, I would say. And um, our goal is to find, to talk about the investment in the creative industries, meaning it's not uh, what we had before with this interesting panel when it was about supporting the creative industries, to uh, try to find out whether it's different or whether it's, there are overlaps. Uh, I would like to start by some slides. Uh, because what are we talking about? Um, cult cultural industries. Maybe we can see the, the slides. Because yeah, the click. Yeah, there it is. Uh, because at our center in Zurich, we have a lot of data on the, on the creative um, industries. Uh, what you see here is um, um, Eurostat data. And you see that Switzerland is quite an interesting country when it comes to creative industries, to cultural occupation. Um, this is um, how um, the... Um, country looks like when it comes to municipalities. Um, you see quite an interesting um, federalistic um, um, map, um, share of overall economy um, or um, absolute numbers. Here you would see cities like Basel, Geneva, Zurich, um, this is where we are, more or less the Lausanne um, um, cluster. Um, you see interesting things such as here, um, Lugano in the Italian-speaking part of Switzerland. It's um, public broadcasting, motivating uh, private um, investment in the, um, in the creative industries. So it's quite um, a, a success story, uh, but if um, we look uh, or compare Switzerland to other countries such as France, UK, then 
there is no overall policy on the creative industries in this country. Um, nobody cares um, about it, uh, but it's successful. So this is um, the question we would like to discuss uh, today. Do we really need some overall policy or is what we see here, is this the Swiss way that we don't believe in those um, overall political programs that we have um, private initiative and uh, that's exactly the, the topic. Maybe we can see now uh, put again the slide with the, at least with Terry's name and um, and and not um, Dara's. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so um, let's let's start by a very simple um, question, Dara. Um, if if you um, would have to name an interesting um, creative industry startup in in Europe, in the world, um, perhaps in Switzerland you would like to invest in, uh, which, which startup would it be and, and why? Just in a few um, words. It's actually hard to say in a few words, uh, but I will try. I think it's very important when we're talking about successful, understand like correctly what does it mean. So, for example, it can be related to uh, capitalization or uh, successful exit or maybe, I don't know, scaling, um, self-sufficiency. And I think that if we are talking about capitalization, we can name, for example, world-known open seed Decacorn, uh, with uh, which like marketplace worth uh, 13 billion right now. And if we're talking about, uh, for example, self-sufficiency, we can name the startup which is currently should be here in this room, Cuseum. Uh, hi, Brendan, if you're here. Um, uh, or also we can name uh, Me Journey when we're talking about great scaling. For example, it's a, it's self-funded startup which has really show great results right now. Uh, or, yeah, it's like lots of lots of interesting startups right now in the sphere, so. Okay, Thierry, if you would have to name uh, an interesting um, company. Yeah, it's, thank you, it's, it's, yeah, it's quite difficult. Uh, I mean, I think as uh, Daya said, it's, it's really a question of how to define success. I think, um, especially for the creative industries, uh, depending on who they are, what they do, uh, they have a different definition of, of success. So I think that's, uh, that's a little bit difficult to, to say. If we talk about investment, I mean, private investment, and uh, so if we talk about private investment, people are really looking at exits. That's what is the most important thing, because as um, some of uh, um, some Finnish investors, uh, when they invest, they always tell me, uh, you know, the day I invest, it's a bad day. It's really a day where we don't know what's going to happen. It's really, the good news is really when you go to an exit. So the investment phase is not so, uh, you know, it's a, it's a big risk and then it's the exit. So obviously the exit is what is interesting for investors and then obviously uh, the biggest uh, exits that we have in creative sectors and in fact even beyond any other sectors are in gaming. So if you look at, at different companies in gaming in, uh, in, in Europe, uh, have been very, very successful in exits. Um, so in terms of investment return for exit, it's definitely in gaming that is, is there. There's nobody else really uh, uh, in other creative sector that get this kind of uh, very high valuation for, for exits. Thank you. Well, you, you both say that um, um it's difficult to answer the question because it's difficult to define what success means in the, in the creative industries. Um, the state of the art in research um, um, when it comes to creative industries is that it's a very heterogeneous field. We had this um, already, um, different sub-markets from classical music to, to gaming. Um, that um, it's somehow a, a slippery term, uh, creative industry, who is responsible for it? Is it the Ministry for Cultural Affairs or Ministry um, of Trade? Um, very, there's rather few data um, on, on it. We have some at our center, but who is investing in the creative industries? How much money is it? I'm sure in Switzerland, um, few, few uh, people know about it. 
what values are created in the, in the creative industries. Is it um, economic? Is it social? Is it political? Um, and so on. It's, it's quite a blurred um, field where people don't even agree whether creative industry is for profit or not for profit, whether it's about art or, or not art, whether it's about formal structures, companies, or just a project. So this is what, what we all know. When it, when it comes to investing in, in this field, is it, do you see similar um, challenges that it's more complicated than in other fields or um, Thierry? And, yeah, okay. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, I mean, to be honest, nobody wants to invest in creative industries. Uh, I mean, the term, nobody understands, you know, what it is. It's so broad, you know, it's from antiques, it's part of uh, creative industry to advertising, etc. Um, I mean, what we do is we're trying to focus on IP creation because that's where we think uh, some value could be created. And we are looking at only a few, uh, a few parts. We're talking about audiovisual, so already it's quite broad, gaming and music, especially uh, music tech uh, that we are, we are focusing on. But we are looking at, OK, how can we find some scalable uh, project based on original IP? OK, and that's where we can talk about value, even though, of course, we're talking about intangible assets. So it's uh, very subjective and it depends on many things. But at least we can create, uh, we, can, we can start developing some, some valuation based on, on IP. Um, if it's for a business which is more like a service business, like advertising, for example, architecture, uh, it's much more difficult because, of course, the scalability is limited or it's, it's in a different way, you know, I would say. And also, um, of course, there is a uh, lot of creativity, of course, but there is not so much this original IP that could be scalable and redone, uh, you know, in a lack of software. I mean, for example, in Germany, games is still part of a software. Uh, sector, okay? It sees, it's seen as uh, a software, meaning you can, you can basically copy it at n n nearly no cost, no further cost. Do you have criteria to, to deal with the, the complexity in this um, field of the creative economies when it comes to investing in the field? I think our approach uh, lies in education. So we're an accelerator and uh, for us it's very important not just to invest in the startups but to grow startups, you know, like to uh, build them, to help them with the mentors, with, uh, um, you know, like invitation to the demo days and then in this field we really understand who is a really potentially can bring uh, lots of like a big result so i think for us it's mainly in educational field yeah, yeah if i can just add on that i mean we are also running two acceleration programs in fact for the same reason uh, it's basically to uh, to have a better understanding of who is really uh, ready for investment and basically who is also um, adapted to get private investment. I mean, to be honest, um, it's not for everybody. It's very expensive. It's very, very hard to get an investment. Um, and also many projects or many funders do not really understand what it means to get private funding. And uh, um, even if they, I mean, of course, the, the problem, I mean, if I may say that in, uh, in Switzerland, which is the country of banks, um, the banks are not making any good job in the creative sector. And that's why people need money, but they cannot go to banks, okay? So because they cannot go to banks, they say, okay, I need money, so I go to private funding. But the, most of the project we see and we get are not really uh, adapted to private investment, okay? So I think that's something. On, on the banking side, just for, for your information, uh, about uh, two, 10 years ago, I, I worked with the European Commission to create a, a guarantee fund for the creative industry for the banks, because that's something that we, we were very interested to see how we can involve more banks in the sector. So in Europe, so okay, it doesn't include uh, Switzerland, but we, we have now, um, I think, about 25 banks who are working. They are not investing 
as you know, banks don't invest, but they are doing, you know, they lend money for cash flow, uh, for bridging uh, financing, for, for project, and it's guaranteed by the European, uh, in fact, the European Investment Fund in, in Luxembourg. So these are the kind of, uh, of tool that is, 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 is very uh, important to help people who, who need other types of financing. Investment is a very, very small, uh, limited thing. And the other thing we do a lot is this public-private funding. Because obviously, in many countries, we have some public money. Just before, we had uh, Olivier from CNC, who told us a lot about the, you know, what's happening in, in, in France. There are other countries like that where they are a, a, a high level. But the, the question is really about um, how to raise the, the co-financing. Because public money is always maximum 50% of financing, investment financing. So the question is really about the other 50%. So for example, the, the German government created um, four years ago, I think, uh, you know, big subsidy for gaming with uh, 50 million every year just for gaming. And they ask us to look at, okay, uh, we have created that every year. It means we need 50 million of private funding every year for the gaming sector as well. Where can we find that? And that is also a big question on education, private investors to understand why should they invest in the creative sector, and especially in this case, in the gaming sector. So it's back to the education, not only to the startups, but also to the, to the investors. And that's something we are also very active because you, you, you need to explain to them um, the advantages, the, the risks, uh, as, as I started, uh, the biggest uh, exits, so the most interesting things for uh, investors is gaming, much more than any other, other business. Um, so it's, it's a question of how can we talk to them and convince them that it's something that is interesting as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think we'll talk later on financing um, again, but it's, um, we are here also to learn um, from other countries. Um, um, when you say the problem is you have to explain to them uh, why it is relevant to invest in this field, is this um, a common challenge for you too, that you have to, um, why do we have to explain uh, to them and not are the creatives themselves not able um, to do it? Is, um I think um, it's, it's our part of this process to explain, to connect, these both sides, like startups and investors. And from our side, we're creating uh, like half, each six months, we're creating analytics report on investments in our tech sphere to explain uh, where the money goes, how it all works. And it's useful not only for, for the startups to understand uh, how it really, the, how the market is working, but also of course for the investors because they see the startups, they see real numbers. And I think that it, it's quite, uh, it, uh, it's good that we have this part in the process. Um, um, let me ask, I work at an arts university. Do arts universities have a role to play in this? Is it because it's, what do we, how do we educate um, our students? What do we teach? Should these elements be part of the curriculum um, more than it, uh, what is your experience? And you, you both must have um, Dara and, and Thierry. Uh, yeah, so I think that, uh, you know, this academic approach is really important in this process. And uh, education, it's, it's a key element uh, of the market right now. And I think that, for example, Fuel Arts now are also is working on uh, the educational programs which we want to implement to the, to the universities. Now we are working with Sotheby's Institute of Art. We're working with Miami-Dade College to uh, make their programs uh, related to uh, Web3, art, art and tech, because uh, it's the moment when the startups are creating, usually like, you know, from this university level. Um, so, yeah, and also education uh, through 
through accelerators, uh, grants, which is also an important part. And, you know, not just to educate, but also to monitor afterwards, like to help startups after the programs, after the universities to support them. Yeah, yes, I mean, definitely just yeah. one question. Sorry. When do we have to end? Um, because I'm beyond... Uh, well, Open end. <laughs> Twenty, twenty more minutes. Great. Yeah. So fifty-three. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, definitely, uh, we 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 see many people coming out of school, etc., to to come. And uh, um, I think what is important for me is that they 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 have an understanding about this financing part. As I say, it's really back to the, the first question about what is success and how to define success is, is that really the students understand what they want to do and in which direction do, do, do they go and what do they want to, to achieve. Uh, and, and today, the people we see, they don't understand anything about this, this funding uh, process. They, 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 they mix between a bank loan and investment and a public fund, etc. They don't understand the, the differences. And uh, I mean, very often, I'm sure there are lots of exceptions, but uh, very often they, they don't really understand that. And, and of course, it's a, it's a big, uh, for them it's very difficult because they spend a lot of time talking to the wrong people. Yeah? I mean, for example, they, many people come to me and say, okay, I'm going to go to my bank and ask for an investment. Okay. I repeat, tell them 10 times, Banks will not invest. Ah, but I know the guy at the bank, I will ask him. And he, he, he spends uh, six months, one year, waiting for an answer and nothing happens. His project, the project is not scalable for some reason. He goes to an investor and the, the investor says, you know, it's not scalable, I will not invest. He thinks, okay, I'm going to go another one. So it's this kind of thing. And one of the, the issues I see that is very important is the, the fact that in, in, uh, in creative sector, we especially public money, is supporting projects and not companies. Okay, so, so people are focusing on developing their project. And the problem of project is there are two main pro problems. Uh, there are many other, but let's, let's try with two. Or start with two first. The first one is that obviously uh, they develop a prototype, they develop a film, they develop a game, they develop a thing. So there's no revenue, so everything is pre-revenues. So, of course, that's, uh, that's very, uh, very difficult to, uh, to, to, to understand wh what is there. And, of course, uh, if, you, if, if you do a project, it's this kind of hit or, or miss project. Either it works, it makes some money, if, if they want to make some money, or it's not. So it's a big risk. Okay? A company approach is very different. A company approach is to say, okay, I'm going to develop different games, or I'm going to, de to develop a series of, uh, of films, of uh, immersive, immersive, some will work, some will not, will not work, but on the whole, you know, I will make some money and the company will survive, okay? But because public money is focusing mostly, and it's changing a little bit, especially in France, for example, uh, that is very strong, but it's maybe one of the only countries doing that, as long as we invest only in project, we will have problem to, in, to, to integrate uh, private investors. And then there will be always a lot of risk because we say, okay, you see, you did this film and it didn't make any, any money, so it's too risky. But that's not the approach. When the people invest in a, in a company in another sector, they don't invest in just one project. They invest in the company. Okay, so we have for, for Switzerland already two learnings that we, we have a strong banking sector and there is some potential to, um, to um, um, focus a bit more on this um, field, creative industries with specific programs. And it's also uh, to make the, your life easier, guys, it's, um, education. Would, um, um, it must not be only arts universities, but also other universities. Uh, do you have good cases, Dara? Is there a university somewhere in Europe already offering these um, programs to, um, to the students? Or is it all terra incognita? For, um... Um, I think it's just, you know, 
everything is on the stage of development. So it's too early to talk about successful cases. So companies like Fuel Arts are working on on these uh, on these programs, and we are trying to do it as as good as possible. Also, we try to implement them as fast as possible because you know, like. Um, the future is now, and we need to create something right now. Uh, so I think that it will be a really good example uh, to talk about uh, Sotheby's Institute of Art, which are trying to, to work with Web3 and technologies, and also we can talk about uh, Christie's programs, which are also trying to be focused on our tech uh, infrastructure and educate people. Uh, so I think that these will be the the main names I can I can name right now. But I hope that uh, in a few years we will have much more to say right now. Do you have some good cases for? I mean, again, in games, uh, there are a lot of universities now uh, in Germany, in France, in Sweden that are including really this economic part, and um, it. It's there. I mean, it's 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 it always can be can be better, and you know we have a limited of time always in the in the education process. But at least there are a lot of people uh, who are developing that. I mean, for example, my the co-founder of my uh, acceleration program, she's an economics professor at uh, a game school in in Cologne, uh, Cologne Game Lab, and what she does is only talking about economics. And, and funding for uh, the game studio. And they have even built um, a, a small acceleration program uh, for the students to, to really develop their game and also raise funding inside the university. So I think, it's, I think in gaming, it's, it's already in many universities. In film, I think it's a little bit more difficult, I would say. Uh, there are more uh, professional um, education uh, programs that are very uh, oriented on economics. But maybe less, I don't know all, all of them, but maybe less at the university le level, I would say. Maybe in animation, much more, I guess, but in the film, film, maybe, uh, maybe less. But it, it, it's coming, I think. I mean, what is clear is that the, it's recognized by everybody. I mean, everybody knows this trend, that the people need to be much better on this economic and, and financing part. So, so it's coming, definitely, yeah. but it, it takes some time, yeah. Uh, Tara, on in your um, biography, uh, it reads um, art market. So, uh, art market is it also an interesting field for um, this topic, or is it gaming is somehow clear? It's very attractive. Um, um, film is somehow um, um, a bit more difficult. It feels like performing arts, art market. Is this also when, when you? Uh, look at the creative industries as an investor part of the creative industries or is this something you are not that much interested um, in? Uh, I'm pretty sure, definitely I can say that art is a part of this uh, system and we're exploring this more and more and uh, you know all of our analytical researches and reports are focusing on this sphere so as we can see also we can talk about digital art we can talk about uh, art plus uh, technologies and nfts which are currently also doing like steps into being a real investment, like uh, different NFT platforms are uh, doing this through, for example, t implementing technology like Ordinal, so they are hosting events like Yuga Labs, and uh, like different companies are doing a lot for being real interesting asset for the uh, for the investors and the part of the of the market. Okay, so it's it's not um, only a disadvantage that the field is so broad um, in the creative industries, and and uh, but it you can turn it into an advantage and saying we would even heritage or c could be interesting for an investor. Then, or yes, I mean de definitely uh, what investors are interested in is really about digitalization, uh, you know, to 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 make it more scalable. Uh, and definitely, there are many parts of the creative industries that are not yet digital. Oh, just starting. Museums started during the COVID, basically. 
uh, for a lot of them. Uh, you know, in performing arts, there are lots of things uh, happening now in digital eyes, and that's going to be interesting. Uh, so it's definitely an art, definitely. I mean, that's, uh, I mean, the, of course, we're talking sometimes more about platforms, etc. but definitely that's, uh, that's very important. So, in fact, it's... Um, it's an industry, it's a sector that is, is really interesting for, for growth uh, and for uh, interesting for, for investors because uh, of a lack of, uh, of uh, digitalization. One of the problems is the fragmentation because obviously uh, we have a lot of very, very small companies. If you compare with other sectors, that's much more, you know, less, less, uh, uh, with small companies, but you have more uh, bigger companies, so it's, uh, uh, but it's going to happen. I mean, the, the structuration, I mean, at the moment, we are going through a little bit of uh, crisis in any case. I mean, to raise money is much more difficult at the moment. And what we see, for example, uh, is not so much um, uh, raise from, uh, from uh, private investors, but mergers and people working, to developing mergers to together and investing in, in it together. Um, so I think it will be more, uh, there will be less fragmentation in, uh, in certain sector. I mean, we see that already in the games, the gaming sector, in the film sector as well. Many people are, are buying other people and uh, to become, be, become bigger and global. So that's definitely interesting. And the rest of the creative sector, it will take, it will be the same. Okay. Fragmentation is... Um um, a word. Um, let me ask another question. When I look at our students at Zurich University of the Arts, which is one of the larger arts universities in Europe, then I see that our students are very strong when it's about thinking in what is called this what-if mode. They are very strong when it's about thinking how the world could be and not how the world is. Um, and again, it's hard to explain to an investor uh, this mindset, um, which is for me the strongest part of this young next generation, because they have to save the world um, um, one day. Is um, how do you deal, Dara, with this challenge that they are not able to to imagine how things could be, but it's hard to explain this to an investor. Is um, is that something you? You feel, I, this is what I see every day at our university. And um, is, how do you deal with this um, topic? Uh, we also see during our acceleration programs, talking to, to the founders. But I think that uh, we're trying to talk to the founders and explain them how to talk to their potential investors. Like during our uh, acceleration program, we have special uh, sessions regarding uh, talking to the investor, how you should behave, uh, how you should explain your idea because it's not it's very important not just to create but to tell people to tell the world about your idea to make it work and to make other people believe in it so i think you know like all my answers are uh, quite similar because i really deeply I, I think that it's all connected with talk with education with uh, approach when you're like uh, not focusing on one uh, little thing but try to make the whole ecosystem work better okay um they are stealing us time, but um, um, I, uh, I, I would like to address one last question, um, um, if, if it's okay. Um, financing, um, it, um, NFT, crowdfunding, crowd investing, public, public private, what are the next trends um, um, in, in this field? Is it um, possible to say something about it, Dara and then Jerry and then um, unfortunately, <laughs> we have to, to stop. Um, I think I will say much more during my tomorrow's presentation of our investment report about our predictions uh, on the future of the art tech market. 
But what I want to say is that um, it's still very important to um, network, to have a great network. So that's why uh, accelerators, incubators, and competitions and hackathons are still very important in the sphere. Um, and what I see also is that uh, we see how many blockchains appears every day. And art is really a battleground of how they develop. Uh, so when we see how blockchains uh, developing and when the new blockchain appears, everyone is asking like, how they're gonna develop their art ecosystem and their like, you know, creative sector of this blockchain. So I think it's a good trend uh, for the future. Jerry, what are your predictions for yeah, I mean, two things, maybe. Uh, first, it's really about the, how to value uh, IP. Uh, so coming back to, to the first point, uh, I think, uh, you know, there are new ways to extend uh, the use of IP on, on cross-media, transmedia, whatever it's, it's called. Uh, and today, it's not really well done. I mean, it's done uh, in production, but in terms of uh, valorization, valuation, it's not really done. So that's something that could develop. And, and then in terms of, of uh, financing, for me, the, the, the main point today is more to, um, to create diversity of funding. I think today, when people are in the sector, they tend to think really uh, inside the sector, okay, uh, I don't know, film is financed like that, so I finance it like that. And today I think it's all these sectors are, are blurred a bit because they are, I mean, games are done with, uh, uh, film are done with game engine, I mean, there are lots of uh, ways to, uh, to immersive is a mix of everything. Music is everywhere. I mean, you know, this kind of thing. And, uh, and people don't really think about the, the diversity of type of funding to, to fund their, their project and especially their company. Mm -hmm. As I say, if we don't capitalize, so bring capitalization to companies, they will not survive long term. And that's really uh, the most important thing. Okay, thank you, Dara. Thank you, Terry, for this very insightful um, talk and um, yeah, thank yeah, <laughs> thank you to you. Thank you, and I apologize for stealing a little bit of your time. This is the worst part of my job: is telling people they have to stop talking. I'm very sorry. So to continue on this theme of strategy, fundraising, and business development, we will now hear from Anton Politayev who co-founded 110 Industries, was established in 2019 and is now headquartered in the Canton de Vaud. Its objective is to build a diversified video game publisher focused on creating original IP, working with prominent licensed IPs, and publishing third-party titles. As you know, the gaming industry is resilient and very fast growing, worth more than $180 billion in 2022, and 110 industries is part of this booming business. Welcome, Anton. Uh, all right. Uh, cheers to everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for having me here tonight. Uh, so. I will walk you through our business model because it's, uh, I think it should be quite an interesting for, uh, for everyone because it's not super usual on the market. I mean, on the gaming market especially. And uh, we're really happy, uh, thanks for some of you guys and the, uh, the country, so to be here in Switzerland. We started the company four years ago. And, um, uh, our headquarters uh, is in uh, Canton of Bois, uh, near Morsh, and uh, we're really happy to be here. We relocated uh, and actually established the headquarters here because of the super stable uh, political and economical environment because of the banking infrastructure and uh, our producer model uh, as a production center and a production company really suits uh, Switzerland because we don't go into building huge development team here because, I mean, definitely building development team is quite expensive and uh, challenging here. And uh, let me walk you through what, uh, what we achieved, what we are doing, uh, our international expertise, because we work a lot with the US and Japanese and European companies. 
And uh, it's a great place here in Switzerland to work uh, with all the world and the partners across the globe. So, um, does it work exactly? Yes. So, uh, just a short snapshot. So, we started the company uh, in, in the gaming field. Uh, the products are uh, mainly focused on uh, consoles and uh, personal computers, but currently we're also expanding to Nintendo Switch and even mobile platforms because one of the key trends currently on the market uh, is a cross-platform game, so each game should be suitable for any platform. Yesterday, as you, maybe someone of you noticed, uh, Apple announced, and uh, for example, uh, Hideo Kojima's game now is, you can play it on new iPhone, so it definitely goes to cross-platforming thing. So uh, I will describe a bit more, but uh, we are not the uh, development company. We have the producer center and the publishing company. It is very similar to what uh, producers doing into movies or TV ser series segment, for example, and I'll uh, give you more details. So, um, as mentioned, we're working with the two major uh, areas. We create our own original IPs, and also we're working with the licensed IPs. So we have just signed one of the top uh, tier, maybe number one in the world sci-fi franchise uh, license for the movie, and with the idea to convert it to the video game. We also have several original IPs. The idea behind the original IP is very clear. Uh, as soon as your game will become a hit in a champion, the value of the IP could be from several dozens of millions to almost, I don't know, one billion of dollars. And there are several examples of uh, these huge IP valuations and the deals on the market. Uh, also, we would uh, like to establish next year the new department uh, of the third party IPs to scout for the new talent in any region, Europe, US, Asia, and help the guys to build their uh, games, to bring uh, funds, to bring uh, collaborations, etc., etc. Uh, so, um, important to say that, for example, our company is four years old, but we, we already post revenue. We released our first product uh, this year, and uh, not a huge funds, but still we made four million gross revenue and about two million net revenue this year, which is pretty okay because uh, we're also like almost able to cover our burn rate right, right now, so the costs. Um, so, I mean, just, I mean, I, I don't want to, well, I'm, put a lot of emphasis on the uh, video game, like research how the market works. If anyone would like to uh, uh, get some reports, some uh, special data, I got a lot. You can just contact me, I can share if someone wants some special researches with uh, like, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, I mean, video games definitely booming, huge market. It was super boom while COVID. Now we are challenging the post COVID thing. And, uh, for example, mobile gaming market is struggling, actually decreasing a bit because of the latest events with the Apple, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, I mean, and a very important thing I would like to mention here that uh, two uh, core assets on the market, which uh, brings you huge capitalization if you're doing things well and uh, perfectly uh, are development team, which could provide and uh, develop nice product, and IP. So again, IP is an intellectual property. As soon as it becomes popular and successful, it could value a lot and capitalize, uh, capitalize your company. You can monetize it in every direction, in TV series, in movies, I don't know, making toys, whatever you want. So this is very important, two main uh, assets. Uh, so, I mean, this is just the, a bit of uh, lecture part. So, I mean, uh, uh, just uh, four main models of capitalization. So, just direct, uh, direct sales of uh, copies. Call of Duty, I believe currently it's not the best example because the guy is also expanding the monetization model. But uh, first old school uh, example is just directly selling copies to the market offline, online. And that's the, like, P... You, you got your revenue. So microtransactions is the next thing. And uh, 
also freemium. The most uh, famous example is, of course, Fortnite and subscriptions model like uh, World, World War, Warcraft and uh, others. But I mean, also we can chat more if you want uh, on this topic, but it's not the uh, essence of the current presentation. So uh, just a short slide on us again, uh, main uh, highlights. So we have a full cycle experience with our first product, which you could buy, I don't know, PlayStation, Xbox, uh, Steam. We are post revenue. Um, uh, we have the hybrid business model. This is the most important I'll describe uh, in the next slides. And uh, we have signed super famous Hollywood franchise and uh, already having, and now the idea is to expand the portfolio. And we believe in the current super turbulent market because market is super tur turbulent. Uh, and new technologies came to the market like AI, et cetera, et cetera, which helps and also challenges uh, the, uh, the uh, part. Also the economical volatility, as Guy said before. Also investment bubble just uh, like uh, blew up and uh, burst uh, this year, I mean, in the gaming industry. Uh, for example, services like publishing. So publishing is distribution and uh, putting your game on the shelf. Now it's more uh, a commodity and more or less affordable to any team, which is good, but on the other hand, being just a publisher is a bit of like what kind of stupid. Uh, so uh, uh, that's why we expanding and uh, moving to hybrid business model, and uh, that's what I like to share. And ex again, Switzerland suits very good to this uh, cost-efficient uh, producer model as a hub, but very infrastructurally and uh, logistically a great place. Um, so what do we have here? So uh, Okay, so this is exactly the model. executive producers, thank you very much. And uh, we handle marketing and publishing as well. But, but the most important part is building the concepts and uh, receiving the feedback from the market, from first parties like Microsoft or Sony, from publishers, from financing partners, uh, from uh, gamers on your visual uh, marketing materials, etc., etc. Uh, so we have several uh, already games in our portfolio. So in original, one released, one in alpha stage, and two in final pre-development. We have signed one super uh, duper cool <laughs> licensed one. I'll show you in the next slide. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, so this is the most important here. So strategy, I mean, I already uh, mentioned it. So original ones, licensed one, and third party the extension for next year. Um, I think, uh, so, I mean, ju just uh, a simple economical uh, rational here. Licensed is more cash flow dividend basis approach because you don't own the product, you just receiving the license, performing the nice product, but with the audience already within, with a nice copy sold, you make the nice cash flow, and most important, you're receiving a reputation as a company, you're building the team, you can uh, attract any talent for the top tier because everyone would like to join your team to be involved with the top tier product, and uh, you have the great networking, you can knock and come almost in any door with a nice product. But the uh, essence of the thing is, of course, the original. It's more risky. Uh, you need uh, more validation from the market, but as soon as one of your portfolio projects will become a hit, as I said, dozens of millions to several hundreds of millions, just the IP. You can sell it, you can monetize it, you can do whatever you want with it. So um, this is part of our team. So as you can uh, see, part of the guys are historically Russian-based, but we, I mean, <laughs> sometimes difficult on the current market, but... Uh, uh, the guys are very hungry and very professional. Uh, half of the team is uh, super diversified from U.S. to Japan. Uh, of course, for the, uh, in the industry professionals, we already 
uh, invited to the team uh, industry uh, uh, talent and veterans like Kelly, like uh, Satoshi-san, uh, like George as a PR working with the Disney before, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, uh, the, also the essence of our core team and C-level team, we came to this project together from different business areas, from uh, typical like I know, real estate, uh, industrial businesses, for example, Konstantin running operations, and he knows how to run just any business. Sergey, for example, uh, the guy who has a huge background, successful with the movies and TV series, he's working with Netflix, and he brings the, uh, uh, the things from the movies market, for example, how to work with the funnel of the projects, how to create uh, and work with the creative talent, because they are super delicate and uh, special guys. So uh, myself, uh, I'm a strategy and investment guy, and uh, Sergey, Sergey is one of our creative directors, but we already got three creative directors to have the nice funnel and uh, to expand the portfolio. So, uh, but I mean, this is not the most interesting part. So, as I mentioned, we have these, these are our projects, several original ones, licensed ones signed and we're expanding it, and first parties. I, I don't dive too into many details. I mean, uh, interesting thing to mention, so, Original projects are, again, for one who, ones who are not aware, they're quite still expensive, from 5 to 20 million, the production budget. For the licensed, which are more safe, the budgets, uh, in our case, are from 20 to 50 million of, to, to, to develop uh, and to produce the game. Uh, so, uh, a bit on, uh, on the pipeline, on the game, just to give you a short... Uh, uh, like overview of uh, how it looks like. I think there should be video as I. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, I don't want to dive into any stupid gaming uh, technical uh, details, because no one cares, uh, but important is uh, one thing. Uh, this uh, screenshot from the in-gaming uh, in-engine thing uh, is produced by the uh, quite uh, uh, nice uh, US studio. And the case study I would like to mention here uh, for us as a Swiss company, uh, as a producer, that we are flexible in the approach. The, this is what you saw. It's additional content, what's called DLC to the game, which is 90% ready. We will put it on the market next year. Uh, originally, the game you can uh, find and play right now uh, was produced by the Japanese studio. Japanese studio was in the process of development. It was bought by the Tencent. Which brings a lot of, uh, sorry for like French pain in the ass uh, while it happened. Because the another like corporate structure came, a lot of uh, guys would like to leave the studio, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we uh, used to like, uh, we were able to finalize the product, push it and put it on the shelf. But for the DLC, we took the same code we, we, give it, uh, we gave it to US Studio and asked to make the better job. So the guys uh, make these textures better. They uh, add, as you uh, 
may saw several uh, camera angles from the top, from the like 2D, from the like original like uh, sh behind the shoulder thing. So they made inc incredible job with the more visual contact, more polishing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is very nice example. Then you can switch. You can as a producer be flexible and track different talents, different teams. Uh, to make your product uh, better and not just stuck to like one place, one uh, uh, one team, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, what else? Uh, okay. Uh, this is the one of the next uh, the projects like current one, 60% ready. Uh, his, uh, this project is super nice looking because it's uh, Unreal Engine 5, which is uh, the modern uh, uh, gaming engine uh, on the market right now by Epic. So. Uh, Absolutely another story, another uh, characters, another drama, etc., etc. Um, really proud, pushing it right now. Just have, uh, have got the commitments from Nintendo, Microsoft, and Sony. Everyone from the first parties would like to work and they potentially put the mark on the, put the game on the shelf. So um, here's the licensed thing. Uh, I think there should be the video next thing. Yeah. We are, we are not uh, disclosing the name, but for the ones who are in this stuff, I think you'll get what we're talking about. Was there some uh, <laughs> very failure with this video? Because it should be one minute, and it was the last 10 seconds. So if guys could... Uh, Make it uh, happen would be great. Uh, let me know, or I could just skip and... Um. Roger, this is yeah. uh. All right. Okay, some technical problems. So, <laughs> unfortunately, but still, if you want to get more details, someone very interested, I can send you the teaser. Uh, anyway, uh, this is the uh, license we got for uh, almost eight years for one of the most iconic sci-fi franchises ever. And uh, the essence of the license, we got the exclusive rights to uh, develop the game. Uh, premium, what called like AAA game in this, within this franchise. We have signed already top tier Spanish studio with a su super successful commercially uh, successful products in their pipeline. We have found as a producer, which is important, we have found so co-producer in US, which is uh, ready to provide the whole financing up to 35 million of the product. But we still keeping the window for ourselves, five, seven million, to co-invest in the project financing on the later, uh, less risky stage. We have signed, we shook the hands just on the Gamescom with the Sony because they love the thing. Unfortunately, the video failed. Uh, they would like to be this uh, franchise in their exclusive uh, library. So we shook hands now in the negotiations on the terms with Sony to become the exclusive distributor for the game. So this is the great example how the producer model works. We, we invest around 200K into concept phase. We pitched, we sell it to the license holder, we signed the license, we invited the studio, we find the financing partner and um, distributor. Now we just putting our executive producer, controlling all the milestones, all the development process. We help with the, for example, music stuff and collaborations and uh, other things during the development process, but this is exactly it. And we're getting the, our royalty as a producer from the proceeds of the project. Uh, talking about music, actually, and some legendary super uh, guy we were super happy to work uh, with last year. We also doing a lot of different mediums, like comic books, like uh, music. For example, uh, last year we have released the first album, like the pure music album. You can find it on Spotify, Apple Music, whatever you want. Uh, this is Singing to the Sky. Uh, one of uh, gaming super famous actresses and models, she was singing. She's quite a uh, great singer, she, uh, but the 
uh, album was produced by Giorgio Moroder. Some of you may know he is this super famous composer, legend, father of Italian disco. We are super proud to have a chance to work with him. Uh, the great thing about our team, for example, our my co-founder and the partner, he's also a composer. For example, on this 10-track album, he composed half of the tracks himself and do the guitar parties, and Giorgio composed the other parts. So we also know that a thing that to be cross-medium, uh, it's, very, it's very helpful. So you can uh, marketing better, uh, cross-market your product, you can potentially monetize uh, this album, etc., etc. So, and important to mention in the video game business, it's super, uh, super expensive to license uh, original track. It could be several hundreds of thousand dollars to just uh, got one track. So everyone is doing own music or covers, and this is exactly what we did. We did part of the original music and part of the different covers. Cover, uh, the rights for the covers uh, cost I mean, 10, 20 times lower, and uh, you can uh, be cost efficient when you produce the game. And we have uh, another uh, very famous musician on the roster. So this is also our business development expertise to collaborate to find the chemistry with the talent and invite them to, to the game. Uh, so about Swiss integration, we are super happy to have already a lot of friends here. We were part of the Numeric Festival in uh, Basel, in Zurich uh, uh, Popcorn, I believe this thing was called. Uh, so, I mean, our team was involved with the booth, the networking everywhere. It's very nice and uh, friendly environment. We already did uh, several collaborations here uh, with uh, super local things like basketball clubs and uh, Ublo, for example. Uh, so, as I mentioned, Switzerland is a great, great place when you don't need to build, I don't know, 300 people development studio. But to be the producer, to be flexible, to have an approach to all uh, resources, it's the great place to be. And uh, thank you for all of you, the, uh, because we are guests here. Uh, um, so uh, two gifts, so to finalize, um, I know there will be some sort of the competition or uh, challenge between different startups. So uh, we are ready to provide our special gift. This is press kit the huge box, uh, we were sending it to journalists and the influencers, influencers all, all, all around the world. So I think it's a nice uh, gift to just keep it on the shelf and also an example how we uh, work with the, for example, press kits and materials as a, just an example or uh, one of the uh, like opportunities how it could be done. And also for the startups who could be interested, uh, for me it was uh, always super useful when I was growing the business and even right now, of course. Uh, we are ready to give uh, the winner the uh, like exclusive certificate or something to speak with me, with any guy on our team. If someone would like to speak with the marketing team or the marketing officer, please. With the, I don't know, with some studios, please. So just uh, give the helpful networking for, uh, for young or not young uh, entrepreneurs, just to be helpful and uh, be, be friends. And thank you so much. Thank you. That's going to be a nice surprise for the winner tomorrow. Thank you very much. So we've had an incredibly busy and thought-provoking afternoon. And to put it in perspective, I'm going to ask Patrick Michel to come up here and say a few words. So. Patrick, what are your thoughts on what you saw and heard today? Well, thank you, Muriel. Uh, it was a very stimulating journey. I will try to wrap up what I uh, guess is uh, the highlights. Uh, we began with the idea and the image of the great variety of uh, all the activities and innovation center in this region, Canton de Vaux. Uh, which was a way to show how uh, we have a diversity of innovative uh, uh, initiatives in Switzerland. That has been shown as well with the round table about the Canton de Vaux, home for innovation ecosystem, and also with the final presentation by uh, 110 uh, with this successful story based here in this region as well. We went through the key 
uh, yeah, the keynote speech by the former president uh, who was raising questions. Uh, what about the digital transformation of art? Um, and he gave also several examples due to the pandemic and how cultural institutions had to uh, reinvent themselves in order to keep the contact uh, with the public. And he concludes by saying that all the digital instruments uh, and the, the digital instrument mechanism should be and should stay as uh, instruments for art and culture. We stayed a bit longer in Switzerland with uh, the amazing project by EPFL and other colleagues, the Leaving Archive Research Group, which was a very good example of interdisciplinary approach, putting together data scientists, art, uh, artists, musicians, and uh, people working in the field of psychology, for example, and how the use of uh, archive as material could be used for innovation, for research, as well as for education. During this journey, when they left Switzerland and we went to Spain, thanks to the presentation of App and Town, which was very interesting and also touching for me with this, um, um, this aim to be uh, inclusive and how to bring culture and art for all, uh, with this um, yeah, special use uh, respecting the Disability Discrimination Act of 1995. We switch then to another topic, learning a new word. Did you uh, guess the digital uh, new word um, about the use of uh, icon and hologram together, which is very innovative? And we had another presentation about the use of hologram or holographic collaboration when you can imagine being in a virtual space with the hologram of your real colleagues being here virtually. The last part of the day was more on investment, the place of the Canton de Vaux, and how to invest in the creation in, in creative industries. Uh, do we need an overall policy or not? What about the use of acceleration program, the role of public-private funding, sometimes also together, and how to raise this co-funding money? And last but not least, we are very happy to listen to this great successful story about 110. And uh, I do thank you all for attending this uh, day. Um, I wish you a very pleasant evening later with also uh, cosmogony and a very stimulating day tomorrow. I have to apologize, I won't be able to be with you tomorrow. I will be in Rome. But uh, I will be uh, thinking of you and all the very uh, interesting and stimulating papers you will uh, and discussion you will bring all together. So thank you very much again, and see you later for a drink and a dinner. Thanks. Thank you. So um, thank you all for your attention. Now for the most more festive part of the day, um, dinner will be served on the ter or in the room there, but I think there are drinks on the terrace. And then if you could be back here at 8.30 sharp for the cosmogony, which we've talked a lot about, which I think will be really spectacular and you don't want to miss that. One little bit of information, your badges. Don't throw them away. You can actually plant your badge in your garden or somewhere in a pot, and you will have chamomile growing out because there's little seeds in the, on your badge. So that's kind of a nice souvenir to take back from our tech. So enjoy your evening, and I'll see you tomorrow bright and early. Thank you.